so welcome back. Uh, yesterday, we were talking about the last co-dimension one bifurcation in the end. Uh, I did cover also two other co-dimension one bifurcations beyond the one that I started with. Remember, the first one was the fold bifurcation, which simply assumed that, which will take place when you have a single zero eigenvalue and no further degeneracy. So these are the conditions for that one. This, this is the geometry to have in mind. And that produces on the two dimensional, I'm sorry, the one dimensional center manifold fold type bifurcation, which we, I think, discussed extensively, including its physical relevance. And then if you assume additionally that you the, the origin remains a fixed point, which often happens in uh, engineer systems, uh, and that was this condition, then the universal unfolding gets an extra x here, and that changes the picture of the bifurcation to this what we call transcritical bifurcation, and in my opinion, the most important in, um, or at least as important as the as the fold, well, but in, in symmetric systems, even more important is the last bifurcation in this family, which was a simple zero. Uh, the origin remains a fixed point, but also the right-hand sign is an odd function. And the reason why that's so important is that very often you have forces that swap their sign uh, as you go in, in the direction of one coordinate and you cross zero, right? Um, otherwise the force remains uh, the same in magnitude. So this is a typical spring force, linear or nonlinear. Um, this is very typical of physical systems, mechanical systems, even fluidic systems. Uh, and uh, then the, the universal unfolding uh, has to reflect that as well. So instead of having an X squared there, we now have an X cubed, as it turns out on the one dimensional center manifold, and uh, again, I, I only showed what we call the supercritical case. It come, it's associated with the minus sign. Remember the plus or minus it arises because this has already been non-dimensionalized and rescaled and everything. And when you scale out the coefficient from here, then there will be a dependence on the result on what you had originally, what sign for the coefficient, you know, either plus one or minus one. But in a specific application, you don't need to do that. This is just for cataloging purposes so that we don't have to carry an additional parameter here. It would just leave that parameter there and depending on the sign of that parameter, when it's positive, then you would have a supercritical, um, subcritical case. When you, it's negative, you have a supercritical case. Um, this is the pitchfork bifurcation. I, I did mention that this is the classic bifurcation that uh, describes buckling in engineering systems whereby you have one stable equilibrium point and it doesn't really change. And then basically there's a catastrophic event, if you will, that if you if this parameter is the forcing magnitude, right? And at a certain point you, you lose stability for this equilib for this equilibrium position. So you're pushing into a force. And you can snap either this way or that way, depending on what perturbation, what imperfection will be uh, right there in your loading. Um, you know, even as you practically do this, as you keep increasing the forcing that already since it cannot be done perfectly, really introduce microscopic vibrations in any structure that you want. Plus it's vibrating to begin with. Uh, um, that's because of course you can increase the efficiency of your vibration isolation, but it's not infinitely accurate, right? So we want small perturbations. And here things are incredibly sensitive, especially behind that point because the strength of the instability here is growing. The reason is that the strength of the instability is governed by this parameter and it's, it's, it's growing, right? So you get exponential decay, you really snap to this equilibrium very quickly. Now, the last one I wanted to discuss in this family is again, perhaps the, so the most um, complex one, because so far these only, what, whatever happened here, the end state uh, always was an equilibrium point, okay? And they, this one is more involved than that. So it does involve the original equilibrium point, but it turns out a more involved dynamic state as well. And I was in the process of describing that. This is what we have on the center manifold. Center manifold is now two-dimensional because the under this assumption of purely measuring eigenvalues, the center subspace is already two-dimensional. I should emphasize that. It's really just one pair of purely measuring eigenvalues. If you have two pairs of purely measuring eigenvalues, that's a different story, right? So it's really just strictly one pair. 
So you have to be in a situation like this. You cannot have further eigenvalues here because, well, unless they are related to this pair with some sort of symmetry, we talked about that a little bit, that basically the number of independent eigenvalues is roughly the co-dimension of the bifurcation. So if you had another pair which is strictly related to this via some symmetry, you still get away with a co-dimension to study, co-dimension one study, sorry. But the but but generally that's not the case. The eigenvalues have their own life, right? Um, and if it just so happens the two are crossing at the same time, then then you will have to enlarge both the dimension of the center manifold to four, and also generally speaking, the dimension of the unfolding also goes up. The co-dimension of the bifurcation, rather. Okay, and I said this is typically happening in oscillatory systems where where you lose stability with the slowest or the least stable mode generally. So the way to proceed is that we have a two-dimensional center manifold, which will you will also have away from the critical value of the parameter, so away from this state. But I just wanted to discuss first the, the, the true center manifold, which does happen at this uh, uh, bifurcation value. And I think that I call that mu naught, the bifurcation value. So you know, then it's a it's a two dimensional graph over a center over the center subspace, and you can look for it as such. And we've done that. We've done we did that in a one dimensional case, but you can do it in a two dimensional case. The UV are coordinates with respect to the bases that you squeeze out of the eigenvectors. The eigenvectors are complex, so you take their real and imaginary parts, and in, in the phase space they span a plane. They are not no those. Real vectors are no longer invariant, but their span is invariant. Okay, that's the beauty of of uh, using the complex eigenvector for something still in the in the in the real setting, right? And uh, and the, you just simply reduce the system to that. At this point, you don't do anything else, and uh, this this gives you the standard linear form for such a system. And the, these are the nonlinearities expressed on those coordinates. But again, just to make sure we know what we're talking about because we did one example explicitly, this is, this is an n-dimensional vector field, right? And it, and it depends on n variables, right? But when you construct the center manifold, it's a two-dimensional graph. So n minus two directions, so to speak, become enslaved to, to the u and v coordinates, right? So therefore, and you remember, it, you can understand the dynamics of the center manifold just by restricting to it. And when you restrict it to it, it's going to be, become a two-dimensional vector field. So that's why these are this, this is a one-dimensional function now, one-dimensional function, altogether a two-dimensional one, and, only, and they only depend on u and v because the remaining variables have been enslaved to u and v, right? Um, so on that, and, and, and this is the form, luckily, that most of, most of what we need for the, for the upcoming analysis is contained here. So these you need to know at least up, it turns out at least to cubic order. Uh, but this is no big deal. I mean, one, one can, there are even symbolic packages or analytic packages that, that do this calculation for you and find the center manifold. The MATLAB packages all over the place. People have written them for nothing, if, if, if for nothing else, for academic purposes to, to, to instruct, say, in an undergraduate course. In this course, since it's a more advanced course, I don't spend time on that to run uh, these MATLAB codes because I, I'm more interested in the principles because I also often see that when people go through that kind of training, that academic, then they really just learn about, oh, how interesting nonlinear phenomena are, which, which they are, uh, no, no disagreement there. And also, oh, there was some code that I needed to run and produce something. I need this. I know this from interviewing people who have taken uh, courses like this elsewhere and not much remains other than the the all that the orcas, which which is great and so that first part but here i'm i'm a bit more focused on, on principles that hopefully stay with you and you can then if need be you can look it up and reconstruct and write your own code because these things are not hard to write so this is more a, a graduate course rather than an undergraduate one so, um so the normal form that then we can do on this center manifolds depending on parameters. Uh, remember, the center manifold survives if you start tuning away from this critical uh, value of the parameter. There will be a nearby manifold, a nearby slow manifold to which it perturbs. 
and people have done the work of, of finding the normal form of this system on that surviving center manifold. Since you're moving away from the critical value, you're perturbing this matrix here, and you're actually introducing the, the real parts of these eigenvalues that right at the criticality only had imaginary parts, right? So those will appear here, because the mu was the real part of the eigenvalue, right? And also the, the imaginary parts get modulated in general as well. So these omegas, which were right there, actually, I should actually write omega naught, because it was right there, omega, they, they become modulated and they will become general functions, which will be the general imaginary part. So what, again, in terms of this picture, this was the critical case, right? But as you're crossing the, both the, the real part, which is the, which is the distance from the origin in the real direction, as well as the imaginary part, right? Uh, which is your distance, uh, well, I should show it here, right? Distance uh, from the horizontal axis, both of them will generally be changing because you know, you're not gonna be crossing like this, but on some general path for both. So both the imaginary parts and the real parts of this passing crossing eigenvalue will be functions of mu tilde. And here they are. And then these functions also typically become functions of, of mu tilde as well, either because your original system, the nonlinearities had a dependence, and, and I'm certainly allowing for that, but also the center manifold itself depends on mu tilde, right? So it would have its own deformation just based on that. So when I, when I even if my, is it so happens that my nonlinear terms don't actually depend on mu tilde, when I restrict them, to a mu dependent manifold, then the restriction will be affected by the fact that the manifold is mu dependent, hence the restriction will also depend on mu, even though what I am restricting originally had no dependence on mu. So that dependence can come from a lot of sources. However, as it turns out, the, that dependence in fact is only important here in the linear part and only at leading order. Um, so it, it I introduced for the leading order term of this D naught, which is really the rate at which this eigenvalue, the real part is growing, okay? And um, omega naught, we already defined, that's just the leading order term here, right at, right here, this, this length. And A naught is just the, the value of this at mu tilde equals zero, okay? So that for that, you don't need to track this, mu dependent manifold, you can just go to the critical case that the bifurcation happens and basically use these two functions to calculate A naught. So this formula has been obtained by, you know, by multiple people. I think first, first by Andronov in the 2D case. And then I think it was Hopf and with some contributions from Bogdanov who established this for the n-dimensional case. Uh, basically that this cubic, the leading order cubic term here is a function of uh, the various third order derivatives of F tilde and G tilde evaluated um, at zero. And uh, also some more complicated nonlinear function of their second derivatives, right? So just if for argument's sake, this which actually happens a lot, if your system had no quadratic terms, only cubic nonlinearities, which I say happens a lot because, because of the symmetry of forces, right? Then uh, if that is inherited on the center manifold, then this whole part is out, okay? And it's, it's, it's all, you simply need to take these and no multiplication. So the formula then becomes considerably simple. Uh, and where I was, then I made non-degeneracy assumptions that this crossing speed is non-zero. Okay, so you're, you're really crossing here with the non-zero speed. And again, what that, what that excludes is the case of turning back or even you know, going there and then coming back along the same path, right? Interestingly, it doesn't, in principle, you could then still cross like this, right? And we call such a crossing topologically transverse because you do get from one side to the other, uh, but not with, but with a tangency, right? But this first order theory, this is, would be very rare, right? I don't even know, you know, it, maybe you can cook up a system in which that happens, right? So certainly this, this way you're crossing and then, but your crossing speed then is still zero. So 
That means that I could not be relying on the leading order term here. I would have to go for the next term because the leading order term would be zero, right? So that would require further analysis. So that is also excluded because it's non, even though it's crossing, but non transfers or topologically transfers. So these are the two conditions. And I just noted, and this is where I stopped yesterday, that, that uh, both are very reasonable and essential. And certainly this excludes linear systems, but also excludes conservative systems, actually, for which this, is, this turns out to be dead zero, this term. Okay. Um, some, perhaps I'll come back to that, why after the fact this, this is ex in fact expected that this should be zero for conservative systems. But I gave you, for instance, an example, which would be the Duffing equation on the plane, which is here, the classic Duffing equation with the nonlinear hardening spring plus linear damping. And when you set the damping parameter equal to zero, uh, then the whole plane is your center manifold. Actually, your face portrait is just like that, a center. But um, so this would be y and this would be y dot. Um, so your whole plane is a center manifold. So you're right, already you are in the UV coordinates. And uh, because of this damping, you will have a non-zero speed at which your imaginary eigenvalues cross due to the introduction of damping. They move away from the imaginary axis. But if you work through this calculation, uh, then, then you actually don't want to work through because I can tell you in advance that you will get zero for this. Uh, and I'll, again, I'll come back to that why after the fact that, that in fact is expected for considering system. systems. If I don't come back to that and forget, please remind me. All right, so these are the assumptions that go to this hot bug theorem. Any questions before I get going? Let me state the theorem then. I think I need the dividing line because I got carried away with my remarks here. So uh, how do I do that? Now I need, I wonder if I can do this and it does stay. Yeah, that's intelligent. Recognizes what I wanted. Okay, so then uh, there exists. And in this business, uh, sometimes perhaps unusually, there exists an unique uh, extended center manifold. So this is a case in which actually the manifold about which we're making a statement uh, is unique. Um, but it's not that there, there aren't any competing manifolds there, uh, but they don't have the property that, that I'm gonna describe now. So from the perspective of this property, it is unique. So this is the extended center manifold depending on mu till that. Okay, and I formally still attach it to zero, although it may have moved, but originally the whole story started from move from um, zero. And mu tilde is much less than one, and you know, changes from, from zero, on which uh, the dynamical system, let's give it a name. Sorry for the scrolling. Never called it anything. So this is star. Um, is um, locally topologically equivalent to the leading order normal form, which I'm going to write now, which is going to be this normal form, but stripped of all the high order terms. And also, I'm just going to be using the leading order approximations here. So the statement is that that's OK to do. So under these non-degeneracy conditions, these indeed don't, I mean, they're technically be deforming the orbits and whatnot, right? But they're not going to change qualitatively dynamics. So whatever conclusion you reach from here will be robust with respect to the addition of these and with respect to the high adding the high order terms there. So the statement is that we are already topologically equivalent to the simplified normal form, which in polar coordinates is r dot equals r. And I just write the leading order term here. D not mu tilde 
plus again leading order term in that a, 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 a alpha mu or a mu coefficient remember that and theta dot equals uh, omega naught just the leading order purely imaginary part b naught u tilde uh, plus e naught r squared so this is really a beautiful and important result because it really allows you without worrying uh, about you know okay but if i add the high order terms this is going to change the conclusions that's as i told you that's usually a, a worrisome thing because you don't know uh, the answer to that but people have done the heavy lifting for this and in fact you even get uniqueness that there will be a unique manifold on which this is true okay there will be others nearby but there will be a unique one with, on, on which this is true and therefore there will be a unique one for, on which uh, we can explore the dynamics and make conclusions and whatever we find will be uh, true for the whole system locally now I have to say for years I was unaware that, that this was completely in the, independently from the math literature this equation was studied and established in the physics literature for the same phenomenon so uh, this is also known in the in the physics and especially fluid dynamics literature as the stuart landau equation primarily in fluid mechanics, because people have spent a lot of time on these instabilities, trying to understand them. Now, it's not the same level of rigor. It's, it's in the context of tricky expansions, but those are very insightful. I always find those very insightful and, and also very hard for me to follow because the considerations that go into them are very different from what I used to. I, I tend to think in terms of geometry and invariant manifolds and reductions. And then once I have that in my mind, then I perform the algebra. The, in the physics community, when they developed these equations, they were not, not having any geometry in mind, center manifolds and anything, but they were really just starting tricky little expansions um, uh, near these instabilities. And we're trying to see what dominates and whatnot, right? So it's, it's ultimately, a formal calculation, but very insightful calculation, right? It's a different philosophy of people. And sure, sure, I mean, they would not have statements like um, this is topologically equivalent for the rest and that sort of thing. But I think nevertheless, it's, it's, it's really impressive that people with different tools came to the same conclusion. And uh, uh, let's then discover this system. So the, the first case, now we have more parameters than before, but a major simplification comes from the fact that the R equations decouple. And I already mentioned to you that this is due to the normalization. If we just stayed in this setting here and uh, passed two polar coordinates in U and V variables, the two equations will be fully coupled. So R and theta, you will have sine theta terms and cosine theta terms appearing in the R equations. Uh, the normal form is, is very smart. It, it really sort of sorts out what's important and what's not important. And it says that, you know what, those terms where you, they're just sort of the theta dependence, just sort of just modulates the evolution. It introduces a little wiggle as a function of this theta variable, right? Imagine on this, on this plane, right? Theta is in this direction, we are. Uh, yeah, as you move around, you know, the theta will give a bit of a modulation, but by a nonlinear change of coordinates, which is the normal form, you could actually straighten those out and theta, the theta dependence then drops out from the R equations, right? However, this term cannot be removed. And that, that is, at, and there will be many other terms at higher order, but the, luckily there's the result that they don't matter for the purposes of the analysis that we're doing here, right? So that comes really handy because look what we have. Then we have a one dimensional dynamical system that we can analyze and theta dot, when this is a rotation in theta, and as long as I'm really close to the critical value of the parameter, so mu dot is small, and I'm working close to the origin, so my conclusions that I draw from this equation uh, involve small r values, then this is just a small perturbation to this rotation. So theta will get some modulation, but fundamentally it's not gonna stop, right? 
So it, it always, it's not going to change sign either. So you can just kind of think of it as something going on in the cloud and really focus on, on the R equation. So this decoupling help. So, so note that R equations decouple, R equ just a simple one. And that means it can be analyzed. separately. Okay, so let's do that. So the first case would be then, because now I, even in the R equation, this is a major simplification because I don't have to deal with the parameters in the theta equation. In fact, they turn out to be unimportant for what we're going to discuss. So I don't need to go after these. And I, it was already these two that were, were featured in the statement of the theorem to begin with. So the case one is uh, A naught and uh, D naught are bigger than zero. Look at this equation. We've seen this equation not long ago. This is in fact, the unfolding of the pitchfork bifurcation. If I scroll back here. Look at this, the same structure, except that for canonical reasons, uh, this was, this was um, you know, the, the, the coefficient of mu delta was normalized to be one, mu tilde was one, Right now I have D naught here, okay? And the coefficient here was plus minus one, and right now I have A naught, okay? But when, when I unscale, and then I, I don't insist on rescaling the nonlinear terms, then I lose the plus minus here, as I told you, because originally you start with an A naught. And then also I will have a general constant here, multiplying mu tilde, which, which is D naught, instead of one, right? So this is a pitchfork bifurcation, uh, in in that in the R equations, okay, and uh, in fact, it, it it since both of them are positive, then which which of the two pitchforks is relevant? So here, um, the supercritical, so the subcritical was when the sign was positive. Remember, when this sign was positive. And here, think of it as having a positive one multiplying mu tilde. So even before doing the analysis, what I expect is that this case will correspond to a subcritical pitchfork, okay? That's just my anticipation based on the analysis I've already done, right? But we can, we don't need to rely on, we can redo it again, but that turns out to be correct. So this is a subcritical Pitch for bifurcation in the in the R equation. But I can just formally, in fact, very quickly do that analysis. It doesn't take much time. So here's the bifurcation diagram. My mu tilde parameter is here. Now the vertical variable is R instead of X. Not that it makes any difference. And again, my interest would be to draw these one dimensional face portraits. And I shouldn't forget that this is not the whole story now because the theta variable I have factored out. So that keeps rotating in the background, right? We'll get to that in a second. But since it's a pitchfork, we know that the that these are all equilibria always indeed i mean look at them if you look at this equation r equals zero is always an equilibrium point okay and since both of them are positive when you look at the linearization at that equilibrium point okay and d naught is positive and i just assume that for now this is a fixed constant is a property of the system the rate at which you're crossing the origin the sonobifurcation bifurcation parameter it's a system feature Okay, um, and it's it's positive because I'm actually assuming the interesting case that you're moving in this to you're losing stability, right? Um, and then a naught is another fixed parameter. So what is then the stability of R equals zero? For mu tilde less than zero, I can read it off from here because then mu tilde is less than zero. I have a negative number multiplying R, so the linearization has a negative eigenvalue. So then it's stable. 
So in, on this domain, it's stable, okay? And then new tilde flips its sign, right? And all of a sudden, this becomes a positive number. So on the other side, I'm going to be unstable. These are all fixed points. So 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 far, no no big deal, no no major change. And I'm just indicate the arrows. So this is stable. And on the other side, I have unstable. But let's not forget what makes the makes the pitchfork pitchfork. There's another branch of of uh, equilibria, and that other branch of equilibria when both of these numbers are positive, uh, D naught is positive, A naught is positive, then in order for me to be able to solve this equation and get, a, get the other equilibrium point, so equate this with zero, I need to have a negative mu dot, a mu tilde, sorry, right? Because then ne negative plus positive will have a solution. Again, I assume that A naught and D naught were, were a positive. So that other branch that I know exists for the pitchfork will arise for negative mu tilde values. So I indeed correctly anticipated that this is a subcritical pitchfork. Excuse me, then accept that to be parallel. Now, before I draw the other end, let's just spend the second, the other uh, leg of the pitchfork. I'm still not happy with this because it should come in with a, it's parabolic. So it should come in something like that. Okay, so normally I would then draw the other end. Why am I hesitating? Because in this context, this is a polar length. So Formally, I can look at this as a dynamical system defined on the whole line for any value of R, but it will not have any meaning uh, for the original dynamical system when the, R, when the R, the polar length is negative, right? So formally, there is this other branch, which I still indicate, but it has no meaning in this context. It will not relate back to the original uh, dynamical system. So the R equals zero, or R less than zero, has no meaning. For the original Tanako system. Okay, again, simply because it's it's a polar length. But nevertheless, this part is valid and that part is valid. Okay, then let's just complete this picture in terms of arrows that, that I know already that this this was this is going to be unstable, this fixed point. And, uh, and that's it, right? Right here, this was the, oh yeah. Oh, okay, so I don't spend much time on the negative anyway, the negative part, because that's not, uh, not relevant. So this is what I'm, I'm seeing. And you could say, all right, so what's, what's the big deal? It's just a pitchfork bifurcation, except that let's not forget that there's an angle here in the background. So, excuse me. I need, to, looks like I need to reconnect. I pushed the wrong button. Okay, so excuse me for the in interruption. So I'm I'm back now. So let's let's try to figure out what this means in the original coordinates that I that I care about, which were the the UV coordinates, which are closer to the physics of the problem. These were the coordinates within the eigen uh, space, the center subspace. So U and V. Okay, so they're looking at the center manifold from above, right? And these now account for theta as well, because R and theta were simply polar coordinates. This was R, right? And this was theta in this plane. So I'm translating the conclusions. 
The theta coordinate, like it gets modulated slightly, as I said, as long as I'm close to the origin, it's not gonna stop. So it's, it's, it's essentially a rotation, modulo slight uh, modulations in the speed of it. But, but that has no bearing on what R does. So R does this, right? Now, first, of, then let's try to understand the, the meaning of these equilibria. R equals zero is just right here. So it doesn't matter what theta does, it's just a fixed point. So this branch, no matter what, gets mapped into that fixed point there. And now I'm gonna interested, be interested in the case of mu tilde uh, is less than zero. So let's look at the case, some mu tilde less than zero case. Okay. So I'm, I'm singling out one of these, right? So then I have actually, to be specific, I have a stable fixed point right there. And then I have this other fixed point. Now that other fixed point is a fixed point for R and theta is rotating. So what does that mean? It means that R is not changing and theta is rotating. So this is what I get then. And on that, I'm just rotating, well, in this case, because of my choice, depending on how I choose theta, I'm rotating in this direction. I, 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 I sort of like the, this rotation direction. Uh, if, if I pick theta that way, then I can always achieve that uh, depending on how I introduce theta. Did I measure it you know, this way or that way? Uh, anyway, so uh, I need red. So in, the, in these coordinates, I get a circle. And that circle we call a limit cycle. Generally speaking, a periodic orbit. And this is going to be an unstable limit cycle, as we already see from the pitchfork picture right here. So it pushes things away. So it's certainly unstable. Okay. So let's try to understand what the what the trajectories do relative to that. If I start close to the uh, un, uh, stable fixed point, then I decay down. If I start close to the limit cycle from the inside, I decay down to the fixed point. But not let's not forget that theta is rotating, right? So the way I'm going to be decaying down, I'm going to be forming a spiral. So I, I depart from there, and I spiral into this fixed point. And if I'm sli slightly above, then I'll be growing exponentially, generally speaking. I mean, this is when I linearize, I get an exponential growth rate from the linearization for R. And eta is, again, rotating in the background. So it pushes me away. So if I start nearby, then my distance increases and I go away. So that's why this is an unstable limit cycle. And of course, if I start, say, from here, then the same thing will happen, that I just my distance keeps growing. And if I start from here, then the same thing will happen, except that won't be so jagged. So I'll be spiraling in. So this is really our first uh, uh, non-trivial nonlinear dynamics example in which you get a steady state out of this calculation, which is no longer a fixed point. So the, even though all you had was in, in this domain, uh, a fixed point, say when you change mu tilde, say from positive to negative, and all of a sudden that fixed point was unstable, now it became stable, but you created something which you may not actually observe, you will not observe this directly experimentally precisely because it's unstable. You will have a very hard time, uh, no, it will be impossible for you to start on this exactly and stay on it. Even if for some reason we already probably want to hit a point uh, on a curve, on a plane, right? But even if you have a way of doing it, this is unstable. So the smallest perturbation, um, high order terms that you have ignored in the normal form, okay, um, will get you off this exact circle. Because let's not forget that, that what you get from here is topologically equivalent, but not identical to the full system. So these high order terms that we are ignoring and correctly concluding what the dynamics is, so these high order terms, 
they will then change this thing, right? So they will introduce a little wiggles in it. They might, you know, change its shape to something like that. I'm exaggerating it because, but but even if you, you know, you look at your physical, you find your initial con physical initial conditions right on this this orbit, then then you're not on the real one. The real limit cycle, which we're guaranteed to have will be slightly off, right? So let's not chase it anyway, but let's realize what its significance is. It acts as the boundary of the domain of attraction of the fixed point. So this is the boundary of the domain of attraction. of u v equals zero zero okay um, and the amplitude of this we can just so that we fix it once and for all you can get it by solving this equation for r now you will get a plus minus because you will have to take a square root but remember this branch has no physical meaning for the original system so we only keep the r because as this example shows it's a distance right so we get out of this, uh, this is our u squared plus v squared. This will be our r, the length, equals square root of uh, minus d not mu tilde divided by a0. All I did, so this is r. I wrote out the solution of this being equal to zero, right? You equate that with zero. So you get a very specific expression for the amplitude of the limit cycle. So you know what your parameter value is, you know what the, the nonlinear uh, coefficient is, and you know what D naught is. You can make a very specific prediction for the amplitude of the oscillation. And that's why, as I mentioned, apparently, as, a, as I, I believe this was the case, I heard it from somebody who saw it in the, in the archives in the Soviet Union, the, the formula was this one, is a secret for a while. So this one together with how you get there, right? Which is that. Because at the end of the day, all you need to know to predict the, the amplitude of the oscillation uh, that bounds your domain of attraction is you just need to have a form like this, reduce the center manifold, right? And once you have these functions, then immediately you can first plug into this, calculate that, and here's the formula. So it's, when you code that up, it's a split second, and it does give you a prediction as to what will happen. You're for your domain of size of the domain of attraction, which is quite valuable, right? It will be hard to, you know, impossible to uh, observe this limit cycle. But once you're over, you will see that something has changed because now your, your oscillations are going. So any system for which you find, and this is something that to recognize that a subcritical hop has taken place, any system that has the property that you perturb it a little bit, it oscillates and then dies out. Per perturb it more, oscillates, dies out. But this is sort of a critical level of perturbation over which instead of dying out, it starts oscillating and even you know, grows further. That's the hallmark of, of, of this having happened. Okay, so that's the hallmark of having a, a, a finite domain of attraction and this. Um, this so, so serves as the boundary of that. Um, there's a, I try to find this. I, I had a little movie for this just to show this effect. And that's kind of, it, 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 it requires a little bit of, because uh, it's not a clean example in the sense that it involves impacts. But if you believe me that, again, the same works for, Poincaré maps and the you know, various maps that you can define for impact systems and so pass to a discrete dynamical system, which is then smooth for that map. And then you have the same, same th theory, then, then you would believe this. So this is, a, this is a woodpecker toy, which you may or may not have seen, but I see the thing with this woodpecker toy, the guy doesn't necessarily show that, but how do I stop this? But it, you can see, I mean, I, you know, as a student, one of my professors showed it to me in mechanics. And you can imagine what, what you have here uh, 
this this little wooden woodpecker is attached to a rim and that rim is kind of loose on this very thin um, beam right so i'm able to pull it up and down the reason why the woodpecker is there is that the the, the rim is somewhat larger than the thin rod and it's tilted and when it's tilted, the friction keeps it there, right? So that's the only thing that keeps it there, the friction. There's nothing else. So if I slightly move that move back, woodpecker slightly and completely straighten the, the rim, I would be able to do this up and down. So it's just the fact that it's slightly tilted, okay? And it has the property that if you perturb that apparatus just a little bit, then, then you will see vibrations and they die out, okay? And you hit it a bit more, then again, you have to be careful with the size, and then they die out and the toy is really not working. In order for you to make the toy work, you have to, I'm not, you know, you don't have to be brutal, but, but there has to be a sizable uh, hit on this woodpecker. And then what happens, uh, this is what happens. And that's why it's a toy, right? So there's this additional degree of freedom that you can just ignore and because say reduced to the center manifold, if you will, and, and the remaining motion is a one degree of feet of motion, but with an impact, that's the only thing, right? But you could imagine instead of having an impact there, when, when the woodpecker hits um, this uh, pole, uh, ha just have a very, very stiff uh, spring, and then it will have the same effect. And it shows it nearby. See, there's quite a bit of displacement. You need that for this to happen. But otherwise, the very fact that right now it's just sitting there, it tells you that this must be a stable equilibrium point. Because as I told you, there's always tiny perturbations in light. So this is a stable equilibrium point, which means that small perturbations will keep you there. But a large enough perturbation will then, this is now kind of a small movie. This is a, a limit cycle in one, one degree of freedom. And there's an additional degree of freedom, which is your, which is your height. Okay, And that's kind of being factored out. Then see now the rim, how it, it actually tilts back and forth. Okay. So that's one example. And there was one, this uh, stick slip movie, which um, it again, it, it's not, not the cleanest example. Well, it's just this Windows media, it doesn't want to play it. So. I'll pull it up next. I can't play it on this one. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that maybe next time and show you that movie. It, it's another manifestation of this happening, unless I can. Oh, there's a stick. Oh, no. Yeah, but apparently, maybe I've already converted it. Uh, let's see which one was the latest. 13, two. Let's try this one. So this is, I didn't give credit, this is Gabor Stepan's lab in, in Budapest, and uh, this is a stick slip vibration, which I should stop this. If I can, how do I stop this? So there's a, there's a rotating uh, disc, and within that, you, you have a little um, block, uh, and that block is attached to the middle part of this arrangement, through a very flexible little wire or pole again. And that in fact acts as a spring, okay? And also a nonlinear spring. So this thing rotates when you, when if it's not rotating, then you just basically have a, a, a block on it. And uh, that block, if you hit it and the, and the table is not rotating below it, it will just sort of along the perimeter of that, of that uh, podium, will be oscillating like that. So interesting things start happening when this actually starts rotating. That rotation imposes through friction an additional force, general forcing on, on the block, but it's still an autonomous dynamical system, okay? Um, so it's basically just forcing it in this direction. And just to sort of understand the phenomenon, this is a vibration now, right? So this is a limit cycle. If you stop the limit cycle, the vibration by artificially, the vibration develops again. So 
This is a stable limit cycle. So this is not something that the current setting that I have just discussed would explain. You can come back to this. However, if you change the rotation speed, look at this fixed point now. The limit cycle doesn't develop. The fixed point was sitting there by itself. It was asymptotically stable. The small perturbations that you always get, and it was getting small perturbations, were dying out. Okay. And it still it has died, even for fairly large perturbations. Previously, for some small perturbations, it died out. But I think, I don't know, I have to wait and see what the end outcome will be. It's again dying out. It seems like all we have here is just this asymptotic stable fixed point. Okay, in this case, so the vibrations do die out. And again, it's sitting there, there's nothing else. Well, then they change. This is, this is a different setting in which I haven't seen this movie for a while, so I have to wait for the outcome. So it was asymptotically stable sitting there. And it, so if you stop it, again, you see that the fixed point is, you're not leaving the fixed point. The tiny perturbations always, but it's as fundamentally asymptotically stable. It stays there. But it does seem like that in this example, there was a coexisting stable fixed point and a stable limit cycle because it wasn't dying out. So this was in fact not a, uh, uh, not what I wanted to show. Uh, I'll come back to this later because we're not done with the analysis of the, the possible cases in, um, in the normal form. But one of the cases will be precisely this. So what you will, what, and I need to find that case, what the way it would manifest itself and did manifest in the experiments is that the, you would leave the, the slab there. And even if you perturb it slightly or not so slightly, you know, that, that oscillation would die out. However, over a certain critical perturbation level, uh, the oscillation would not die out, but actually stabilize. So that means that you're not going back here, but rather you're beyond this point and then instead of growing you know, infinitely large, which in a, in a feasible realistic mechanical system wouldn't happen again, you will be converging to an other limit cycle outside, which is stable. So that when you see the coexistence of a stable fixed point and for large enough perturbations, a stable oscillation, it means that between the two, there had to be an unstable limit cycle. And on that center manifold, at larger amplitudes, you actually have a stable limit cycle to which you're converging. So you will never see the actual unstable limit cycle, but it separates the domain of attraction of the larger stable limit cycle and the, and the asymptotically stable fixed point. And I think that was the last bit in the movie because the title said asymptotically stable fixed point and coexisting with asymptotically stable limit cycle. So there's an indirect indication that's, that there was this in between, right? It's just that, you know, remember this is a local analysis. All this model can predict is that here you're unstable and you're growing. But after a while, when R increases, since this is a local statement about topological equivalence, after a while, this you have the limitation of locality. However, then the particular nature of the system kicks in and usually these are, when you have large oscillations, you start paying a penalty. So after a while, the, the forces acting in the spring are really large, so they're gonna confine you. And the result of that, another limit cycle is created here, right? In fact, if you think about it, that's exactly what happened with the, with the, with the toy as well. Because uh, when small perturbation, the toy was sitting right there, okay? So which means that whatever mi microscopic oscillations the that Paul had, he wasn't reacting to that. They got they got damped out, right? So it was a stable fixed point. You hit it large enough, then you're not settling down anymore, but you're outside the domain of attraction. But the toy didn't go to infinity, but rather it went into a mode in which it was just packing, and it was that the tac 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 that was a stable limit cycle, right? 
So in fact, that is more than just having this structure, but also both examples showed the existence of a stable limit cycle outside. Okay. Um, the, before I move on to other parameter configurations, I wanted to draw an alternative picture of this, which is more, this is closer to the phase space geometry. Uh, and say for, for the interesting case when mu tilde is less than zero. Okay. So the phase space geometry, by the phase space geometry, I mean that there was some somewhere in this phase space, the large full system had a center subspace, right? Somewhere. So that's what that was EC. It was an origin at which our analysis was based. And uh, there was a center manifold exactly tangent to it. Now, since this is now mu tilde non-zero, that center manifold is going to move in the sense that it's no longer tangent exactly, but it's still pretty close to this uh, to this manifold. Okay. Okay. So here I have some approximate tangency. The reason why it's uh, approximate because I had exact tangency when the, the, the center manifold depending on parameters was exactly evaluated at the bifurcation parameter value, but now this is center mu tilde at zero. Okay, so this is sort of a, generally speaking, a cup-shaped manifold on which I have now a limit cycle somewhere. This is what it looks like. This is the part that I guess I don't see for this manifold. And then general solutions then in this case, uh, leave the limit cycle. I should indicate them in black. They develop this distance, right? And then they come back down here. And I'm, if, when I'm above the amplitude of the limit cycle, then I will grow. So say I start here, the amplitude starts growing, come around, grows even more, but I won't attempt to throw it any further. And it's something like this, right? So this is the picture in the phase space. And these directions have, you have N minus two of those. So this really indeed can be the phase space of say a beam that you have discretized for the purposes of numerical analysis. And then, you know, it may have been hundreds of thousands if, well, for a beam, you probably don't have to do that much, but it was say a structure, an engine block or whatever, right? And the or turbine uh, blade structure, right? And all the other modes are still stable. This is the one that there was a single mode that was losing stability. So all those other modes are just graphed and enslaved to these two modes. So this surface then lives in that high dimensional phase space. Okay. Um, and um, in the, and the, the one other picture is customary is that in the, if you draw the bifurcation diagram, In the in the uh, I guess UV eta tilde space. So you know when when I had polar coordinates, I could decouple the polar direction, just draw the bifurcation diagram in this space. So what is it? What would it look like when I now use both the UV coordinates? Um, so I still have this. Uh, U tilde here, that's my bifurcation parameter, but now I'll be using two other directions, the U and V, that are orthogonal, 
like so. So this will be say u and this will be v. And again, the interesting case, the I'm just gonna be interpreting this figure in terms of uv. So instead of just having a, a length representation of what's happening, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be showing the full dynamics, which also introduces, it involves the theta direction. So in the, what doesn't change is that this part will be stable. So I indicate that the mu tilde part is stable. So this is stable here, okay? And then this is unstable, this part. So my little trajectories that start nearby will be driven away. And in fact, you know, one, one thing that changes is that the strength of instability will be stronger and stronger because mu tilde is increasing. Okay, but topologically, this is what I'm getting and there will be a change here. And uh, to describe that, I just take another cut of the, in this phase plane or bifurcation diagram here, and that will be some mu tilde value, which is negative. And then in that plane, I will have this unstable limit cycle. different thickness for that, something like that, okay. Uh, I still have a fixed point right there. And uh, in that plane, again, that's just an individual face portrait now, right? Because mu tilde is a bifurcation parameter, but instead of now just showing one direction as a fun, you know, the face space, individual face space uh, portrait, for face portrait, as a function of mu dot, I'm showing both, both the u and the v. So here, the trajectories will spiral away from the limit cycle into this fixed point, and also they grow, if I put to the limit cycle, go away, right? I can, you know, in gen generally they will, after a while, reach another steady state, uh, the limit cycle that we have seen, okay? And there will be an envelope of these limit cycles when I when I look at these planes across mu tilde values, because the amplitude of the limit cycle will come down parabolically to zero. That's what we have obtained. So this is just yet another way of looking at things. I'll try to draw that. Not much success, let's see. All right, approximately, something like that. And then there will be here individual limit cycles in each and every plane. Oops, right? You know, individual fixed points right there. Okay. So, and, the, and this profile, the radius of this is what we know. The individual radius is, uh, minus d naught mu tilde over a naught. Okay. Any questions on this picture? I just want to say that that in these cases where all the other eigenvalues are still in negative complex plane, there will be an underlying stable manifold in the full phase space, right? Which let's not let's not forget about that. So I, I only have room to draw it as a one-dimensional, you know, curve. But but th this includes all the remaining directions. So this will be the stable manifold. Uh, also depends on mu, but that one will be unique. Now it turns out this manifold, this uh, center manifold with this particular property. So the one that, that carries the limit cycle is also unique. There will be other center manifolds which also come in tangent or, or kind of hover around, uh, but they will not have limit cycles. 
and because of the remaining directions are stable, this, this whole thing, what's happening on the center manifold will be very relevant for everybody else, at least in a neighborhood, um, because all the other generic trajectories will be pushed towards the center manifold. And once they are here, then depending on when they started, well, they either kind of pick up the dynamics outside the limit cycle, or if I launched them from someplace else and I was with the appropriate initial conditions, they pick up the dynamics inside the limit cycle and then we go here. If I'm astronomically lucky, then it turns out there's a, a whole tube of trajectories that actually go straight to the limit cycle. But those are, it's an unobservably small set of measure zero, but technically it does exist. There would be a tube sticking out of the, of the limit cycle as well. And those exactly go to the limit cycle. Okay, sorry, I keep getting these notifications for some reason now. Uh, any questions on the picture? I have a question. Please go ahead. So in the last picture you draw, there will be only a central manifold at metal zero, right? Um, by last picture, you mean the last that I was working on or, or this? No, uh, yeah, the bottom. This right at the bottom here? Yes. So, uh, what was the question again? Sorry, I didn't. Just to confirm, so there will be only a center manifold for mu nu equals zero. Uh, correct. So in so th there will be so for mu tilde equals zero. Uh, sorry, this these uh, reminders keep keep coming in. Now, um, so right here. If I draw the, the, the face portrait here, um, the face portrait here ref refers to the planar face portrait of this equation, right? I'm not showing here any manifolds because that two dimensional curve for, for any given value of mu dot is a reflection, it's a representation of the dynamics, reduced dynamics in R theta or correspondingly in UV. So in this picture, I don't have a chance to show the manifolds themselves, the center manifold. What you see here is the dynamics on the center, on the center manifold, the parameterization of the dynamics on the center manifold, right? So this curve is not, not the center manifold either, but this is a manifold of limit cycles that, that I get for different values of mu tilde, okay? So this, uh, the bifurcation diagram doesn't enable, enable me to show uh, things. Now, if you, your question was, is this, uh, is this the dynamics on the center manifold, what I, what I have here? And uh, the answer to that is yes. That's the dynamics on the center manifold, not the, not the center manif manifold itself. So what's the dynamics on the center manifold? Uh, well, on the center manifold, it's hard to answer, right? Because right there, when mu is zero, this term is out. And this gives me a leading order prediction for the dynamics right of the center manifold. And it will be crucial what this A naught is. So depending on my assumption here, A naught was positive. This actually right there, when this is out, this is positive. Then this gives me overall a weak nonlinear instability. So right there, under this assumption that I have made, the dynamics on the center manifold right there will be just the same as these, but these refer to normal non-degenerate elliptic instability, whereas right on the center manifold, I will have a weaker form of instability, which is still not that I can really show you. Um, because this picture doesn't show time, but it's an algebraic instability. But this is what happens on the uh, reduced dynamics on the actual center manifold until they equal zero. Does that, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if I did a good job answering your question. Does that answer the question or? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, okay, you're welcome. All right, so the, there's a lot about that, so I can go a bit faster with the other case. The other case is, in fact, the one that's perhaps the most important. 
So the case two is then uh, when we have, let's just again assume that I'm crossing with a positive speed, so I'm losing stability. This is a classic case of loss of stability in oscillatory systems. But my system is such that if I want to think of that term there as a as a spring characteristic, then, then it's maybe I could call this softening uh, as opposed to hardening. So I'm just changing the sign of that nonlinear term, uh, which is system dependent. That will depend on my particular problem. And in order to get this picture, I assumed that it was positive. Now I'm assuming that it's negative. How does that change the picture? Well, it, well if, if I were to believe everything I've done for the pitchfork bifurcation, which I should, because this is a pitchfork bifurcation in R, I should be able to conclude immediately that this is just a supercritical pitchfork for the R equation. Indeed, I'll leave it to you to check, but they just take the, so the pitchfork picture uh, in terms of what the stability of the fixed point uh, does, that doesn't change, right? Because it, it, this question is, is all about the sign of the nonlinear term and non the sign of the nonlinear term doesn't influence the stability of the fixed point. So that part is the same, but I have the pitchfork branch on the other side and now it's stable. And again, I'm, since this coordinate is R, that part has no meaning for the original system. So I just, it's the same deal. That's why I'm uh, using a dashed line there. And, and what, what I have here, this is mu tilde, okay? And again, that, that branch is explicitly computable. I just have to solve that. And I have to equate that factor with zero, okay? And uh, it's the same R equals minus D naught mu till that divided by A naught. But it, it's now occurring for mu naught positive. That's why this is positive. This is negative. That's negative. So in, it's the exact same formula but it would not make sense in this domain. It would give me a negative number under the root, but, but it does make sense on this domain. So what does that translate to in the, in the UV plane? So in the UV plane, again, the interesting case is when now, when mu tilde is bigger than zero, before that, I just have a stable fixed point here, but now I have an unstable fixed point here. So there is a loss of stability, but I created by the same logic that we used to uncover the subcritical case, I've created a stable limit cycle. So this one I will see because general orbits from my unstable, now unstable fixed point, well, except that it's at least in the in the in this at this leading order, it should be symmetric. Uh, it should be a circle at leading order. That's that was my. That's why I'm redrawing this now, hoping that I can get that right. Okay, uh, I mean a circle symmetric with respect to the origin. So this is now stable, and I come out of here spiral onto that. And also if I'm outside, I spiral onto it. So this is called a stable limit cycle. And this is incredibly important because they, well, well, the other was important too, but I never saw it. This case was important because the non-trivial object that was born in the bifurcation, in fact, it was subcritical to the bifurcation, was a shrinking domain of attraction. So the object itself, I was never able to observe only indirectly because it was bounding the domain of attraction. But here, an object is born 
out of a stable fixed point. I lose fixed point stability for the fixed point. And instead of that, there's a, a growing vibration, but the vibration stabilizes at a finite amplitude. If I then increase mu tilde, the parameter, then it will be a larger amplitude vibration. And this really happens a lot. And that's why this was you know, huge technological interest always to predict that sort of vibration. When does it exactly occur? And what is the vibration amplitude? Again, because again, based on things that, that you, can, you can compute, uh, you can predict the vibration as a function of mu tilde. And you don't have to do this experiment. It's so another matter. People have then conducted experiments, both numerical and lab experiments, and it, you know, it's spot on. Until, of course, the, the assumptions start breaking down because if mu tilde is huge, your deviation from the bifurcation parameter, then other things can happen. But this characteristic parabolic amplitude growth, I, I, you can now you know, draw the same pictures, and I have that in my notes now, the same type of bifurcation picture on the other side, right? So it will be here, and then, then the limit cycle will be stable, and we'll have this parabolic shape. But, uh, See, see the notes for that. I've redrawn, I think, for, for that case as well. So let's give names to this because I haven't done that. So this phenomenon that you see here is called the supercritical Hopf bifurcation. And what that belongs to but what the, the physical phenomenon, so that you recognize it when you see it, is the creation, excuse me, there's more. The creation of a stable finite amplitude oscillation after it, as a fixed point loses stability. And then I go back here and I call this one something. So this, this is called the subcritical half bifurcation. Where, in which the non-trivial phenomenon that we get out of this actually happens before the loss of stability. So the interesting thing is there before you lose stability and after you lose stability, you know, you would need some high order analysis near the origin. You're just, you're just being ejected from the origin. But before that, the bifurcation actually exhibits itself, itself by giving you a diminishing domain of attraction. This is sort of also the simplified way to think about the instability in pipe flows. Uh, a view on that is that I mentioned that before this sort of finite stability, you have a pipe flow and as you increase the Reynolds number, it's more and more sensitive to perturbations and you can jump to turbulence, right? And you can sort of think about that as this being the infinite Reynolds number case, and this is just the Reynolds number going to infinity. And what you, you have here is your laminar state. And the, the domain of attraction of that laminar st state shrinks to zero. So that's why, why you're you know, approaching, I mean, this is infinity. That's why, I mean, you would need a rescaling, blowing this up and projective geometry and whatnot. But uh, intuitively, this point would be infinity, which of course, it, it's not a clean analogy because it's the finite point, but something like this happens over there. That's the current belief is that that domain of attraction is shrinking. And that's why, you know, when you're close to this, then, then, then it's much easier for you to be outside. And then in that case, you do to go to other states that are uh, not laminar. The only reason why this is, I mean, it's a bit more complicated that there are a whole lot more directions and everything, but this is one, this, this couldn't happen for certain parameter values when you do have a uh, center manifold at at the infinity. Okay, any questions on this? To me, the I always forgot what super and subcritical were, and in this case, the way I memorized it is that this is super that you actually have a you know something that you can observe. That's that's really super. And the other one, a subcritical, is also interesting, but that, that uh, well, you could say it's sub, right? Uh, but it's not something you observe, but this is the wow, the, you know, all of a sudden oscillation. I wanted to show you a, just a couple of examples. Maybe I played the movies from here of this happening. And uh, I write this out in my, in my notes, but here I don't want to lose time uh, on uh, 
writing them out. I already, I need to look for these one second and then I share my screen. I already looked for these. I need to find them again. Sorry about that. Which means I need to move things around a bit. It's in my courses folder and uh, it's one that half bifurcation. Okay, so let me try and share this one. Share screen and uh, Well, if all goes well, this is now shared. So one, okay. one example, if all goes well, you see this where, let's uh, see first a, a peaceful example. Um, see what happens is that, this vibration develops on this glider plane. And let's not forget that originally, I'll play it again. That's not how it was meant to be flying. It was flying with the, the, the wings as intended originally, which means that you have tiny vibrations, but those vibrations are under control, right? Now, typically what happens is a major parameter in, in these flying problems is the flying speed. So just think of that as your new tilde or something. So that lowest mode whose vibrations are most noticeable uh, at some point uh, will lose stability in, in, in cases like that because you, 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 your speed was like that. And all of a sudden, then you lost stability in that mode and then you go to a limit cycle. And that's where you see that. Incidentally, something like that happens often in cars that grow a bit older than things that were originally tight, all the screws and everything. Uh, you might notice that when you drive a car that at a certain RPM, they start vibrating unexpectedly certain parts of your car. That's exactly then what happens there, half bifurcation. Because again, what was originally tight and it's looser. So you basically, the although originally it was not vibrating when the car was new, right? The Over the lifetime of the car, the, some of the elements have now stiffnesses that have changed, right? And then you can drive them through a half bifurcation. They don't react, you know, they have little vibrations up until you hit a certain RPM. And then they have these large vibrations and a limit cycle develops because it's a constant vibration with a constant frequency, right? So let me play the glider again, if I can find it. Where was it? Welcome to Apple TV, all these unexpected announcements. Once again. Let's look at this one. See, it's and at some point it's losing that stability. Before that, nobody was making a movie because it was uninteresting. It's now maintained, and then it's again back to normal. So whatever you know, the the pilots then learn to to counteract that by saying, "Oh, wait a second, I'm in a domain that I'm not supposed to be." Then you change your velocity, then that parameter you tune yourself away to the other side of the bifurcation. You're okay. Now this can have, this was an interesting movie, but this can actually have a whole lot more dramatic consequence in the case of motorcycles. And for the case of motorcycles, this does happen, unfortunately, it's called, in fact, for, re for clear reasons, a death wobble. Because you drive the motorcycle, you change your speed or road condition. If, and you know, before that, if you drive a motorcycle, you can all already feel vibrations, but there's substantial damping involved in these motorcycles. So they will damp them out. So essentially it's an asymptotic stable equilibrium when you go. But if you, if the road conditions are such, your bike is such, and, and the speed is such, then you may have a half bifurcation at which point the oscillation is no, no longer stable, even though you have these damping dash parts and everything in there, right? And that's what leads to what's called death wobble, because unfortunately it has also led to tragic accidents. And you see this, you know, in a case, this is a actual motorcycle competition and you see what happens. It, it See, if, even if there was a near, uh, an outside, that limit cycle was 
was just having, having a very large amplitude, right? And the driver couldn't control it. And uh, luckily, I think this wasn't fatal or anything like that. Let me play it again. But it's clear when, you, when it comes out of that curve, it's still not oscillating. But the, the os oscillation develops afterwards, right? And, and you, you don't see there's a, it's a well-defined frequency there, then, then it's gone. So this is something to, to worry about. And, and it's, it's not just only in these bikes that are driven, you know, these competition bikes that are driven under extreme conditions. But in fact, sometimes there are recalls of bikes that are already in commercial circulation available to people. And unfortunately, people who are not even as skilled as the driver of this bike, motorbike, so they don't know how to handle these accidents. It does happen. So this was an actual announcement from some years ago. I mean, in some, I forgot where this is from, but Suzuki had to recall the bike and install additional damping because there were several accidents of this happening. And uh, that's just a half bifurcation at work, a super critical, which was unfortunately not so super for the drivers who were uh, impacted by this, but it does happen in real life. Um, Another family of problems where, where you have this is aerodynamics. And that's why you know, I repeatedly said that this was at some point top secret uh, in the Soviet Union because the military applications of this phenomenon, predicting this phenom phenomenon, eliminating this phenomenon, um, controlling this phenomenon are very important. So uh, one area related to that is aerodynamic flutter, which basically flow structure interaction problems. And there's a little mo movie um, that I think collects these. This may have been done. You will see several phenomena that are related to this fluid structure interest. So this is a NASA movie. It's a bit old one by now, but but I think it was a great collection. So the the, the phenomenon is called flutter, right? The development of these oscillations in fluid structure interactions. This is the classic example of the Tacoma Bridge, which people have you know differing explanations for. And the mechanism can differ, but look at this. This is a limit cycle pretty much. One mode of oscillation on this beam has become unstable because before that it wasn't oscillating and then the beam collapsed. And these are experiments, the wind tunnel experiments in which various wings start showing this. And this is something that you clearly want to eliminate because it can lead to catastrophic failures like that, right? So at some point the material cannot withstand the oscillations. These are things that, that people want to eliminate. See the consequences. This is just the development of a stable limit cycle. Again, it's the, that oscillation, now a different mode of oscillation. So all these structures can lose their stability to a limit cycle. These are continued oscillations with the same cycle. Uh, same frequencies. They all go by the name of flutter, aerodynamic flutter or flutter. Yeah, so that's that's why people worry about those. And this is the closing picture, which knows flutter shows no flutter because this is how things are supposed to be working. So just think about this picture. Are there no vibrations on the wing? Of course there are. Everything vibrates in life. But that position is stable. And that's where you want to be. Constantly, those vibrations get damped out. So you never at the exact intended you know, hypothetical equilibrium point. But you always reassume your vibrations, but they remain tiny. But again, there will be one of those, which kind of the weakest, the most weakly stable. Um, among all your modes. And that's where if you are not careful with the design and the operation of the vehicle, that's where you can have a half bifurcation on a center manifold. And then, you know, the, all of a sudden this wing starts oscillating. The other modes are still stable, right? So it's not, that's why. And, and that's why the oscillation has a well-defined frequency rather than white noise, okay? That's why it's really a single frequency oscillation, even though this is a very high dimensional problem with multiple modes, but only one so that sort of that's again another hallmark of a half bifurcation that the the oscillation is is periodic but periodic with one frequency of course yeah otherwise it would you know it would quasi periodic would not be a, a periodic orbit so the, let's just say single frequency oscillations so that's why I wanted to show today 
uh, we're done with co-dimensional one bifurcations, and hopefully you got a sense that, especially the last one, the half bifurcation is incredibly important. And then hopefully now you know why things are making noise in your car at a, after you accelerated and not before. And then it, actually they may go again. They will go again away because you sort of tuned away from that parameter very often. Um, any questions? Uh, I have a quick question. Go ahead. Uh, thanks a lot for the interesting examples. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for the bike accident, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. how do you know if it's a subcritical or a supercritical half bifurcation? Uh, so in that case, he kept on oscillating till the bike was damaged. So maybe it can be also a subcritical half bifurcation for. So it was a, it it, you're right in that sense. The reason why I was, I was suggesting that it's a subcritical because the oscillations have stabilized, right? Now you're right in the sense that maybe they stabilized, maybe what happened, and maybe this is what you're getting. And let's go back to the subcritical. Except that I need to share the screen again. Sorry. I mean, one thing I know that, you know, I know that this is one because people have modeled this. So that's why. I happen to know it, but but you're right in terms of the phenomenon. How do I know that? How could I anticipate that this is one and not the other? Where were we? So this was the subcritical case, right? That hopefully you're seeing that now. So if this was a subcritical uh, bifurcation, then the bifurcation would then take place in this direction. Now. That is not what was happening because before this happened, the equilibrium point was stable, right? So somehow I, I crossed from a domain of stability to instability for the equilibrium point. So I must have gone in this direction. And when I lose stability here, at least there's no prediction from the Hopf bifurcation. So it will not be a gradually increasing oscillation but there, normally it will be some sort of huge jump into something else, right? Now, the picture was suggesting that the, at some point, the oscillations have stopped growing in amplitude. It's just that the, after a while, the, the driver was not able to handle it. If you're a skilled driver, you can handle it, and people then know, well, this person was probably skilled too, but it, it was just too abrupt. People then know what to do, reduce the speed, and so on. Uh, but the indication was that there's a developing instability and there's a vibration with a given amplitude and given frequency. That's why the inference was that it's uh, not what you see here in the picture, but it's the supercritical, which is, which is this, right? That you have a stable equilibrium point, you change your parameters, vibration develops, so all of a sudden you're here, so you're oscillating with this on this limit cycle, but it just so happens, such a large amplitude, right, that the person must be a fully in sync with it, it to counteract that. Plus, just imagine that there's also other effects because the road is uneven, your bike is tilted, right? So the road conditions are also changing that. So under those conditions, this is very hard to manage. Yeah, okay, thank you. Welcome. I think there are, no, I don't find them, but I've seen videos in which people come out of it. So they actually learn how to ride it and then whatever, they almost get thrown off the bike. In fact, for a while, they're sort of halfway and the, and the, the bike keeps oscillating and then somehow they regain control and then it goes away. Right? So it's not, an un, it's not an unbounded, unmanageable vibration. If you're lucky, then you're able to get out of it. Any other question? But it's very unlikely to get out of it if it's the subcritical case, right? Because the, I mean, the oscillations keep on growing because it's unstable. So it's very unlikely that um, one can exert a control to decrease this bifurcation parameter. Yeah, if you're somewhere here, yeah, then in the subcritical case, you mean, again, you would need to be here. Yes. And yeah. then that state that, you, that you're observing is not coming from this equilibrium point. It has not bifurcated from this. It might be some very high amplitude motion here. And mm -hmm. then you're right, because in, in that case, most likely 
you're just on your way to that structure and your, key, your amplitude is, it keeps growing exponentially, right? Right. So then, then the, but then we wouldn't, would not see kind of this, this, um, yeah, so like, uh, you know, this one bounded oscillation, but you would be growing exponentially and then it's, it's hopeless really. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, that's why the, all these phenomena, even flutter, you do see there's a, you know, loss of stability, but after that, some sort of constant amplitude, but also the planes were, the planes were oscillating like this for a while, the, the, the winds that the wings get, got destroyed. Right. So they would, the differential equation would happily oscillate like that, except that the material is not designed for this. And at some point, the material just fractures or breaks or whatever, right? Because the stresses created by this steady oscillation are just too much for the material. So it's not that it would, the differential equation would still want to put it, push it to infinity. It's just basically the structure breaks because it cannot withstand these, these large vibrations. Okay, anything else? Okay, we're done for today then. Um, we, we'll start with a new topic then next week. Have a good week. See you next week, if not before.